Uh, this is Flick. And this is Rudy. And this is Left of the Dial. We have a pretty busy week this week. We're going to talk about uh, our week in music, which means some new music. And uh, Flick actually got to see Bob Dylan this week. I want to hear about that. And you will. And we're going to uh, be be listing our favorite Halloween uh, themed songs. Or and the uh, scary, the scariest feature, which we do every week, is our banality draft. This week we have. Bon Jovi, which uh, normally I would dread, but compared to the recent fair, been pretty. I'm I'm pretty happy with our results. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, you might be more happy than me, but but then again, it was my choice, and I I only have myself to blame. You, sir, saw Mr. Robert Zimmerman this week uh, when he came to what did he play in Ames? At the did he play at the uh, at Iowa State? Yeah, he played at uh, Stevens Auditorium at Iowa State. And was it a full house? It was. It was. Uh, yeah, it was not not an empty seat. Um, and uh, got some secondhand tickets that I didn't have to uh, actually pay over over face value for. So that feels good. Nice. <laughs> Another highlight I have to say is I was pleasantly surprised when I pulled in and and found out that there wasn't any charge for parking. It was free parking and. It doesn't sound, you know, it's not something I'm going to go into great detail about because I know that's not exciting concert news. But <laughs> these days, no, that's we're... good news. That does yeah, so rarely yeah. happens. Yeah, I know, especially now because because it's just like you're you're thinking, you know, anytime you go to any sort of event, you know, you're going to get all of the miscellaneous ticket charges and taxes, and mm -hmm. and then you know you're going to get charged for parking, and so it just it almost makes you not want to do anything anymore, uh, because because not only do you get charged, but the 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 cost of everything is just, uh, and it, you know, it makes me sound like an old man, but 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 it's true. It's just the and mean everything. Everything has its charges and fees, and and uh, to have at least one of those taken out, it was a, a great relief. Well, you can always move to New York and take the subway to the shows, like I do. But uh, we'll see yeah. how it goes. Yeah, but yeah, the subway is certainly not an option in this case. Uh, not in Ames. Well, it, w it was a thirty, uh, what thirty-five mile drive or something to that effect. So. Uh, yeah, definitely no public transit options going going that far. No. Well, uh, but it was. What? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I looked at the set. I looked at the set list to your show. Looked mm -hmm. pretty good. This tour, he's been doing some uh, stuff that he rarely does, and you got to see at least one of them. I saw, which was Lenny Bruce. But tell me about the uh, set list. Yeah, the set list was was pretty strong. I I couldn't really compare it off the top of my head to other ones I've seen, but it seemed like the most uh, solid, or at least one of the most solid that I've seen. He, he had a lot of the big ones um, and not too much, you know, like I don't want to, I don't want to go into complaining mode, but, but, you know, the thing that stands out the, the time I had seen him previously, which was uh, actually 10 years ago, um, he, he, did, he broke out a really long version of under the red sky, which wasn't really, one of my favorite things I've ever seen him do live. Wow. Uh, but, but this set was, uh, this set had a lot of the big guns uh, right off, you know, like uh, looking at the set list right now, he did It's All Over Now, Baby Blue. That was the second song in the set. Yeah. Um, two, three, and four, he went It's All Over Now, Baby Blue, Highway 61 Revisited, and then Simple Twist of Fate. And, uh, and then he did When I Paint My Masterpiece, which is... Uh, not one you know you're ever expecting. I don't think. I, I I certainly didn't expect that. And I must say the band's version is better than any he's ever done. But that's that's yeah. a bit of a hot take. But we'll we'll, we'll see. Yeah, no, not that hot. I, I I'm in complete agreement with that. The, it's it's kind of hard to top the band's version. And and really, uh, the band's version of when I paint my masterpiece and and the band's version of uh, of um, I shall be released. Yeah, I, I I think those are two of the best. Uh, well, those are two of the best Dylan covers of all time. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's uh, uh, and he did uh, make you feel my love. Um, Lenny Bruce. Uh, 
Girl from the North Country, which I was very happy about. Except yeah, for that's the a fact, great one. Yeah, except for the fact that that, you know, being the most quiet song of the night was the one where you could just hear everybody chatter around you. And then that uh, was frustrating. That sucks. Um, yeah, so it was it was a bit hard to hear at that point, but I was very happy uh, that he played that song. He did uh, Not Dark Yet, which in true Dylan form, very much reworked. Uh, Okay, so so sidebarring on that, like something you know that goes back, um, I don't think to the beginning with Dylan, but but early in Dylan's career, uh, he he uh, drastically would rework all of his all of his uh, songs, and uh, that's one of those things. And 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 I I kept on thinking about the fact that he does make it impossible to sing along. And I don't know if that's why he does it. I, I think know. it is. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it is. But I, I, it, it seems like that might be the motivation. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, so Not Dark Yet even uh, gets that sort of reworking. It sounded like a very different song. Uh, Thunder on the Mountain, which didn't sound very different. It sounded pretty close to the record. Probably, Probably more so than anything else in the set. And got to serve somebody, which might have been like the strongest of the night. And then I, I especially liked what Charlie Sexton did on, on that one. And then uh, the encore was Ballad of a Thin Man, and it takes a lot to laugh, takes a train to cry. Wow. Not bad. Uh, sounds like a pretty good set list. It sounds like he was, uh, it, I, it sounds like it would have had to be a pretty good show overall. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the difference in the shows I've seen, this is the fifth time I've seen him. Sometimes you, you can tell he just, he's not that happy to be there. Um, and I, I think he was happy to be there in, in this case. And that's, you know, that's when you get a good show. All right, well, he's coming to New York for like two weeks. Uh, so uh, I'm definitely going to try to catch some of this residency he's doing at the Beacon Theater uh, right around Thanksgiving. We'll see how it goes. L- one other little bit of Dylan before we get into truly new music. The the latest edition of the Bootleg series is starting to come out. And uh, the, the, this week uh, on Spotify, it's probably everywhere else too, is uh, the original uh, rehearsal version of Wanted Man, which is a duet with uh, Johnny Cash and Bob Dylan. I mean, I'm a big, big fan of the original Johnny Cash solo version that came out in the 70s on Columbia. Um, but, you know, knowing the genesis of the song, I, I really think it's one of Dylan's more underrated songs. I'm very, very happy that it's finally um, starting to come out. And I'm, uh, I, I have to say, I've been excited for other bootleg series more than this this one, but it's up there. This is a top 10. We'll, uh, I'm I'm very interested in hearing uh, more Nashville skyline and more uh, John Wesley Harding outtakes. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I I always liked the uh, the Dylan and and Cash sessions because I thought they had really good chemistry together. Um, not you know it, you're you're basically listening to rehearsals, and I can't recall ever hearing rehearsals that were ever as satisfying to listen to as those. Just because I, I don't know. I, I wish I wish they would have done more together than than what they did. Uh, it would have been nice to uh, to have a full album from from Bob Dylan and Johnny Cash. Yeah, I think if they'd rehearsed those and made fully full formed performances out of those, that that could have been a great album by both of their mm-hmm. standards for sure. But that isn't what they did. Uh, I I don't I don't feel great about talking about uh, buying bootlegs, but. In my history, uh, past life, we'll say, uh, I've purchased my fair share of Bob boots. I was always in the market for those sessions, uh, and I found them. I think I found them at Bleaker Bob's here in beautiful New York. Um, and I, I was disappointed. I, like, I, I heard, I've heard a lot of it already, and I never, that's like one of the bootlegs I've never listened to twice. I just have never yeah. bonded with any of it. Um, I just didn't, I don't know, the, the best piece of it already came out on Nashville Skyline, so. Yeah, it's it, it's funny though. I I think I I can safely say that that is one of the bootlegs I've listened to the most, and so it's kind of funny that uh, 
I mean, apparently, apparently, we we uh, didn't get the same amount of satisfaction out of those. But, no. But yeah, I, I mean, I my only disappointment is that they didn't do more and that they didn't actually do a fully realized album. I think we agree. I think I don't know what else is uh, coming out on this box set. I don't know. Have you ever purchased any of the the super mega deluxe box sets from him? I did get the uh, the one from Blood on the Tracks, which is I just to me is mandatory, but I have to admit it's been out almost a year and I haven't, I haven't mastered the entire thing yet. These, those giant like 10 disc versions of these deluxe packages, they mm. really take a lot of work to get through. I'm not sure. I don't know exactly what this next package is, but I'm probably more likely to buy the sampler than I am to like wade into every disc. Still know if yeah. I can. Yeah. I, I have, uh, what is it? The 1965 one. Um, is that is that the is, is that the title of it or am I forgetting what the title is? Uh, well, anyway, yeah, I mean it, it's kind of the same for me because I, I don't. It's tough to listen to like eight different takes of the same song. Yeah, I'll, yeah, that's part of it. And and again, I, if you read about, if you've read about a lot of these these um, sessions in the past, and you have expectations of what might be on these these discs and it never they never align sometimes it's better the the discs are better than what you thought was coming i thought the basement tape stuff was way better than what i expected um the box set to be uh but sometimes it can be really underwhelming sometimes uh, again i love blood on the track so much that the different performances are meaningful to me i had a i didn't have i mean i had the same stuff everybody's gotten from the um the original new york uh album uh, and then also the uh, the bootleg other bootleg boxes. So, you know, I I think we should try an entire Dylan episode because I think we could turn any episode into a full Dylan episode. Maybe we yeah. plan one out when that box set comes. Well, I'm definitely going. I'm glad you went. I'm encouraged. Uh, I think good things. And I wouldn't if the worst thing I could say is I got to see him do the song uh, Lenny Bruce. That'd be pretty good. Uh, congrats on getting that. Yeah, I, I I was pretty happy to have gone. Yeah, it's been a pretty good year for music overall. There, uh, you know, I don't know how music is retailed anymore. I don't know if they really backload the year so they have big releases at uh, during the holiday season. But there have been some big albums that have come out, uh, and some of them fall right in the sweet spot of stuff you and I organically are listening to. Generally speaking, anyway, it's been a big week. I think we got new albums this week from both. Neil Young and Crazy Horse, as well as uh, Michael Cronin, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, yeah, and there is something to that. I, October always seems to be a big, big month, and I, part of that is Christmas. Um, but then again, uh, there, I don't think there's a big market for indie albums around Christmas time, and, and right. yet there seem to be a lot of great ones that come out in October. Um, yeah, the Michael Cronin, uh, the newest Michael Cronin album is uh already one of my favorites of the year it's it's really strong the singles were really really good and 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 i i am a person who uses spotify primarily for music and uh they they've they've known that i'm interested in michael cronin so every time something new comes from him i i i generally know about it Uh, but i don't always know it's a full album i usually i know when the singles start and they're, the singles off this have been really, really good uh, so far, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, and and the whole the whole album is so so to uh, set this up. Uh, this is the fourth studio album from Michael Cronin. Michael Cronin is somebody that I first knew about as as Ty Siegel's bass player. Uh, I, you know, um, I I had seen him live with with Ty Siegel. And then in, uh, I think, 2010 or 2012, I don't remember which one it was, uh, he came out with his first solo album on uh, Trouble, Trouble in Mind Records. And it was, it, it just blew me away, like, from the get-go. Um, uh, one of my favorite, it, it's still one of my favorite records of the decade. And then his his second album, My MC2, which was on Merge, uh maybe better maybe better than the first one i i for me it's a little bit 
it, you know, it's neck and neck. I probably favor the first one. And then the third one, uh, MC3, I, I felt was a bit disappointing, but probably only because he had set the bar so high. Mm-hmm. Um, not a bad album by any means, but but not as good as the first two. And then with the fourth one, Seeker, I, I think he's right back to you know where he was with the first two albums. Yeah, I can't I can't claim uh, as much catalog knowledge from for him as as you have, but I have I really like uh, I actually find myself listening to him more than I listen to Ty Siegel. Uh, Ty Siegel has is so prolific. And it wading through his stuff over and over can be a slog. But I think Michael Cronin's solo albums are way tighter, um, from at least in my experience. Like they're way more conceptually tightly wound. The new album's pretty good, but I mean the first three singles that came out in a row were "Show Me Shelter" and "I've Got Reason." Those are all pretty uh, top shelf by the album standard. So I was pretty, you know, I I knew the singles before the whole album came out, and uh, the whole, whole thing works, no doubt about it. Yeah, and um, there is something. Uh, so Ty Siegel not only is prolific, but he he can be kind of all over the place. And I don't yep. think these are bad things. These aren't complaints. Um, but yeah, I mean, he can be he can be more difficult to keep up with. Uh, one thing about about Michael Cronin, um, he did take a while between records here, uh, and and. You know, it's it's a good thing that he was able to deliver the way that he he has here, uh, because that is a long time to take off, and and it's you know you expect a little bit more when that happens, and he brought it. He he totally brought it with this album. Well, to throw in a little bit of sidebar trivia, he also has a new song out on the uh, Merge Records Christmas album for 2019. Uh, his song is called Christmas Time Heist. So he's he's definitely he's he's prolific. He has also put out an EP since the release of that album. It's two 17 minute songs I haven't heard yet. So maybe maybe he is um, becoming a little more like Ty Siegel in in, in being uh, quite frequently releasing product. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, he doesn't. I don't think he'll have the same kind of frequency as as Ty Siegel does. But what he does what he does is he uh, he's able to to always uh bring the quality like he, he excels i think in in what just about anybody really strives for which is um making something that sounds uh familiar and yet unfamiliar at the same time you know uh familiar and yet su- surprising at the yeah. same time he, he he seems to do that uh I don't want to say that it's easy for him, but he seems to excel at it. Well, on Spotify, the most popular song on the record so far is Shelter. And I have to say, like, that's a bit adventurous, I think, by his standards. I mean, it's not that he, he's he's not all over the place, but he's certainly he he doesn't make the same record over and over and over again. But I thought Shelter was a pretty uh, interesting direction for him. It was certainly it's not as guitar heavy, I think, as a lot of some of his other stuff. So, or I should say maybe it is, but it's more uh, rhythm heavy. Than a lot of his stuff. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't want to read too too much into like one thing about about the the songs that are big on on the Spotify plays. Um, it's often the first track of an album, and Shelter is the first track of the new one. True. That's so. True. So that could be that could have a lot to do with it. So I don't want to put too much weight on that. It is a great song. <laughs> yeah. 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 Regardless, it is a great song. But yeah. Um. In general, though, I don't. That's why I don't put too much uh, emphasis on on what those uh, songs end up being, because it's often track one, then track two, then track three, and you, you just don't know what to make of it. Well, I would I'll agree with you in this instance. Although, is it all right? Which is probably my favorite song by him. Isn't in his top five, and it's the it's the lead track on the first record. How do people skip yeah. over that one? What the hell's wrong with people? Yeah. Well. Okay. So. Uh, so I won't talk too much about that now because at some point we're going to do our favorite songs of the decade. And that right. is, that's right up there for me. Um, I got hard. it from you. I can't, yeah. I, I got it from you to begin with. So I, I most of my, oh. I don't want to act like I'm a lifelong fan. I, I don't think yeah. I would have gone beyond Ty Siegel without your encouragement. Yeah. So, so when that album came out, 
uh, especially especially is it all right was the song that I, I would take to everybody and, and just be like, you've got to hear this. And um, for those that aren't familiar with the song, it just it starts out with these great like Beach Boy esque harmonies. And then just like this thunder comes down from the sky. Uh, I got to save it. I got to hold on to it. But all right. If, all right. If you, if you don't know the song, go listen to it. It's 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 just it's it's it, it's right up there. It's it's maybe my favorite song of the decade. I don't spoiler alert. It's maybe my favorite song of the decade. It's pretty good. I vouch for it. It certainly made my be- uh It's in my top hundred of the decade for sure. Yeah, for sure. All right, Michael Cronin, uh, I mean, I don't know. We don't have a rating system, and I don't think we need one. I think if we like it, like, you got to give it a try. You just you yeah. got to give it a try. Um, yeah, it's kind of like I like it this much. Uh, it, it's uh, Seeker, Seeker by Michael Cronin, one of my favorites of the year. Uh, definitely um, uh, must, must listen. I'll, I'll just I'll give it that rating. It's a must listen. Bold statement. Uh, you, sir, uh, I believe early on in our uh, figuring out each other's musical taste, I mean, and, and again, we eventually have to do a trailer where we explain how we know each other. Uh, we know each other from working at the same radio station. You have you were always a much bigger Neil Young fan, and I think I actually gave you some shit for over Neil Young <laughs> uh, back in the day. I do think Neil Young has its has put out a lot of albums that don't have a lot of, uh, they're, uh, they're not great. Um, but you can't argue with the best of his work. Like the best of his work is the best of anybody's work. And for somebody to still be doing it as long as he has and still put out, he still makes pretty good records from time to time. They aren't all great, but every, you know, usually they demand a listen. Like there's almost nothing he's put out that I haven't given at least a spin to. This is so again. I'm doing the most general intro I can because your knowledge of this is way bigger, way deeper than mine. I can't remember the last time there was a Neil Young and Crazy Horse um, album, and I also don't know what the lineup of Crazy Horse is at this point, other than Nils Lofgren. So maybe give a little context for uh, just to prove your Neil creds. You don't need to prove them to me. I just want people to understand you know this stuff better than I do. Uh, and then uh, I want to hear what you think about it because I think you've got a little bit more of a of a Neil tune to your. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, so, so the, I I think the first well, yeah. It, there's a lot to Neil. Neil is is not unlike uh, Ty Ty Siegel in being prolific. Um, the best introduction to Neil, if if you need one, is to start somewhere in the seventies because he owned the seventies, like, you know, almost like the Beatles owned the sixties, I think. And I don't know if you consider that a hot take, but, but he really, he, he did very little wrong in the whole decade of the seventies. So that's the place to start. Um, Certainly from like 70 to 75, almost no one has a run like that. And that's got crazy horse stuff. And uh, his solo stuff, like nobody really has a run like that. Well, and 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 it goes on. I mean, it you know, Russ never sleeps is at the end of the decade. Yeah, that's so, a classic. That's almost perfect. Yeah. So if you go up to to uh, seventy five or whatever, um, you're leaving that out. You're that's true. You know, um, it got a little thin after that. Like our, like American stars and bars. Um, it does have some great stuff on it. Star of Bethlehem's great. Like a Hurricane's great. Saddle of the Palomino's in fun. That makes my playlist. But like, is that all killer, no filler? Like a lot of the stuff around it. You know, it, if if you want to say American Stars and Bars is the worst thing they did in the seventies, it's still not bad. I mean, just taking like a Hurricane alone. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know, I, I'll 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 take that. I think anybody would take that. You know. All right, I'll buy that. Uh, so, yeah, okay, the point stands then. The 70s is the place to go. Um, and don't don't just get Decade. Like, Decade is great, but Decade goes back into the 60s. Don't don't be afraid to grab whole albums at a time and just and meditate with them, because that's, that's how I got into it. And I admit, by the 80s, like, some of the stuff on Geffen, I think, 
is unimportant or forgettable. And then some of the stuff, like, are you passionate? I think is Drek. Um, there's some, there's some crud in there, but every once in a while he pulls an ace and he pulls out just a great album. And I don't know if I would say the new one is that, but it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to say this uh, holds up to what he did in the 70s, but it is It is like, a, it, it maybe parallels him, you know, going back to Crazy Horse, which, you know, he, he does every now and then, every few years, he'll go back to Crazy Horse. And, uh, um, you know, it, it maybe is where he goes to get, get some new life. And it seems this seems to be one of the better examples, or at least like the best example in a long time of him uh, kind of find, finding the the fountain of youth a little bit. Um, and and what what I thought was pretty interesting about it, like he even seems to be going back to uh, the way he kind of sound or sounded early on, uh, doing some of the guitar sounds, you know, that go back to the early seventies and and. Uh, probably trying to sing um in a way that you know at his age he probably uh isn't as physically able to but then again it, it is neil young and he was never like the most um technically sound as as far as a vocalist goes uh, but but he seems to be he seems to be kind of trying like i don't know if this comes from all of all of the times working on the archive stuff that he uh, he maybe hears something and, and gets inspired by something he did way back when. But that's kind of what this album feels like: is that he's he's drawing inspiration from his earlier work, and and that might not, that might just sound like uh, nostalgia and boring, but it's yep. it, it it isn't though. So I again, here's where I, my ignorance shows, but. To me, the crazy horse stuff can be good or it can be shit, and uh, the 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 sometimes it's it's a little too ragged for its own good, in my humble estimation. That's not true here. Now I know that the half the band of Crazy Horse has passed away, have they not? I don't know, and and I know Niels Lofgren was in the Stray Gators, uh, who also he put out an archive live album of this year. So I don't maybe I think two Neil Young albums with Niels Lofgren on it in a year. Um, does this sound like a regular old crazy horse record to you or not? I don't, I feel like it's a little more, it's not as ragged around the edges. It's, it's a little tighter than I associate with the crazy horse. It's a little warmer and it's a little more acoustic than I associate with them. Is that, is that just me not knowing what I'm talking about or am I, am I got something? Uh, well, um, Hmm. I, I would say you could actually even go back to everybody knows this is nowhere. And yeah. see some similarities there. That's kind of the. That's actually the album. I think it's the most similar to as far as how it sounds. And I don't want to say it's as good as that because everybody knows it's nowhere's phenomenal. Great. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, almost perfect. Yeah. So I don't want to. I don't want to build build this up and or make it sound like I'm building it up into something like that. But it but it does sound similar to that album. Um. Okay, so so just going back to the lineup. So the lineup on this album is pretty much so Nils Lofgren has kind of taken the place of of Frankie uh, San Pedro, uh, who I oh, so so the the lineup I think that is most commonly known as Crazy Horse is just uh, Neil uh, with with Billy Talbot on bass and then Ralph Moline on drums and then Frank San Pedro on the other guitar. And so Nils Lofgren is now the other guy on guitar. And I, that's really the only difference in, in uh, the crazy horse lineup and, and like going back a long time, uh, going back to like the late, you know, going back to the rust never sleeps and, and a bit before that too. So uh, was Nils Lofgren, he wasn't on Greendale, right? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay, because I... to me, Greendale was interesting. I mean, I didn't, the concept was lost on me, but if I go back and look at like when, what Crazy Horse records are good versus bad, 
that one has its moments. Am I am I the only one who thinks Zuma is the best that they've done together, or, or is that just a rookie opinion? Uh, Zuma's really good. Uh, I don't know about best because uh, again, we got the aforementioned. Everybody knows this is nowhere. Yeah, I I think that that's that's a bit better than Zuma. I think Rest Never Sleeps is a bit better than Zuma. Zuma's really good though. It, there's nothing wrong with Zuma. Oh yeah, no. I take it back. Rust Never Sleeps by far. That's crazy horse. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Rust never sleeps, I would say, by far, then. Um, Live Rust is great, too. That's them. Yeah. So, yeah, this is actually the first uh, album that, that Nils Lofgren was on with Crazy Horse, going back to the Crazy Horse album in 1971. Mm. So that's, that's, that's an interesting bit of trivia for you. Um, uh, so Greendale, though, Greendale is not a crazy horse album are you sure yeah i'm pretty sure we we yeah. can uh yeah let me let me look up greendale just to make sure who let's see who the lineup was so i'm looking at like a uh, broken arrow to me is not that great uh there were some uh reactors not that i don't i don't think i've ever gone back to listen to reactor twice um mansion on the hills half great or ragged glory is half good Half. I Ragged Glory, I think, is is pretty good. That's um, I think that's the best. Uh, that's probably the best Neil album in the nineties. Yeah. All right. Well, I do like Mid East. I am probably the only person who likes Mid East Vacation. Um, that's one of my. Uh, I have a soft spot for that. So uh, how do how I I to me uh, albums rating albums when they're new is impossible. You can't, oh, t- you have to have some time with a record, and nobody's had enough time with any of this stuff to know for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know that we're here to, you know, be critics anyway. Like, uh, I mean, it, so, so if we're, if we're to be critics, then we've got to spend time talking about stuff we don't like. I don't really want to do that, you know. Yeah, I, I agree. If we don't like something, we might say we don't like it, but I don't want to actually have to spend time talking about not liking something. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I just, I just think, you know, we mentioned like, if we uh, spend time talking about it, you know, we like it. And that's, uh, that is fair. So uh, two, two pretty good uh, endorsements there, the Michael Cronin and the Neil Young. Uh, you are a longtime fan of both, and they meet your standards. I am a casual fan of Michael Cronin and a late arrival to Neil Young, and probably not the biggest Crazy Horse fan. And I dig both of the records, so uh, yeah, not a well, bad time. I'm going to give you your props here because Greendale was a Crazy Horse album. I didn't remember it as such, so so there you go. It just it's the it's the backup um, it's the backup singing that gave it away that gives it away. Anyway. All right, this is um, acceptable to me that we have found two good records in one week. This is um, not the most common event. Well, all. you know what? I, I, there's more too, because because uh, so so just to, just some other ones to mention that I've I've been good and listens to, but yeah, I mean we we're both in agreement on those, uh, but I also want to just uh, just list off a few that have been good. Angel Olsen's All Mirrors is very good. Yeah, another, I agree on that. Definitely another, digging that. Yeah, another really good one from her. Uh, Wilco's Old Ode to Joy uh, is is really strong. Um, and I'm I'm biased toward Wilco, but if if uh, if they do something I don't like, you know, like I, they they've done things I don't like. So I'm not I'm not just inclined to uh, to like everything they do. Um, there's there's some stuff by those on our playlist on Spotify. Uh, there's there's a few uh, singles out that have been really good. Uh, Bex saw lightning. I think that's great. Yeah, I mean, it it's is. a Pharrell it's a Pharrell song, and so it sort of just has the same. It has a bit of Pharrell sameness on it, but actually, it's not too bad. This is yeah. Um, it's a little bit of a stretch for Pharrell, and it's definitely a stretch for Beck, but it works. Yeah, but you know, it has a lot of those elements of Beck that are, are that go back to like sort of the anti-folk Beck, um, you know, with with some of the uh, 
some of the uh, the samples that you know, not not that they're samples, but you know, like the yeah. sounds that they're using is 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 kind of elements of that uh, that stuff that Beck did early on, just with a different feel to it, though. Right. It's very interesting that Beck is really making the most commercial music of his career he like really is i know uh he did uh uh, pharrell and jay-z did a version of deborah for a while so it's not like this is the first time he's worked with pharrell but he's his last two records have been very very commercial and very much geared towards uh, um i I just can't imagine the person who's buying uh saw lightning other than nerds like you and me uh are are also buying um you know the reissue of uh, one foot in the grave yeah you'd have to be a real beck fan it's so different in a lot of ways yeah i mean i i yeah i understand yeah i totally know what you're talking about because somebody that comes to beck through uh saw lightning isn't necessarily going to uh grasp (laughs) one foot in the grave or but 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 the slide guitar sample to your point really does it does fit them back together it's a very interesting career trajectory Dobro, there's there's some Dobro on Dobro on uh, on a dancey song. <laughs> yep, uh, and, that is and it very works. good. It does work. He's um he's got a, another sing uh, single. I think I don't know when the actual album comes out, but the second single is has been put up in the last week. I didn't think that was as good as uh, Saw Lightning, uh, but it's interesting. Yeah, the, the other ones that he has out, I think, are fine. Saw Lightning, I think, is, is especially good. Yeah, agreed. Can I throw in, we talked about, uh, when we talked about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, we talked about Shaka Khan, and we talked about I Feel For You, which is, I think, one of her great performances, for sure. Just so happens that in the last couple of weeks, the people who are going through Prince's Vault found the original demo of I Feel For You, which he recorded, I think, on his debut album in like 1978 or something, 77, somewhere in there. Uh, and the the version on the, the first album is very identifiable as Prince right away. Where And the Shaka Khan felt like a very radical reworking. Uh, if you want to hear a radical reworking, go listen to the original demo. I put it in our playlist of what we're listening to. It's acoustic. It's folk, and um, it's or it's not folk, but he was a huge Joni Mitchell fan. And if you're not a Prince nerd, like one of the things I was waiting for on Spotify is when they were going to start putting all of his um, late period stuff up there because most of it hasn't been up. It's all up now, including this album called The Truth. And go dig up the soundtrack or the uh, title track to the album The Truth, and maybe listen to it side by side with this original Prince. I feel for you, uh, acoustic demo. People don't. I mean, again, I, I I admit I am a Prince fan, and that he there's almost nothing he did that I didn't like. But I think people do are sleeping on how great a guitar player he was and how great an acoustic guitar player he was. I, I'll be very interested. Uh, have a listen to the I feel for you demo this week and see what you think. I think it's going to come out of left field for a lot of people, and it's fucking great. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Prince was a phenomenal guitar player. I think that gets lost sometimes. I think people, because, you know, he didn't always, he, he didn't make Purple Rain 50 times, so uh, people hold that against him. But uh, he was fucking good. And, and uh, the fact that they keep unearthing this incredible stuff, like, if he was alive, he wouldn't want that record out. And I feel, I feel bad listening, because I, I don't think he really wants that stuff out. But as a, as a fan... It's so good, and I enjoy it so much. His biography is coming out too. His autobiography is coming out before the end of the year too. That is definitely Christmas product. But I'm, I'll read that. I'll do a book report here on the left of the dial on the Prince bio when that comes out because uh, I just I can't accept that he's dead. And every time I hear new stuff from him, it just makes me both sad and happy at the same time. I'm sure the book yeah. will be the same. Good stuff. Yeah. Um... Uh, so a cu- couple other singles to mention too. Uh, Wire Cactus, do we both like? Yeah, we dig that. Yeah, that's that's a re- that's a really strong song. Um, and uh, Cordy Barnett's uh, "Keep On," uh, which is very uh, very Velvet Undergroundy uh, and and worth checking out. 
Yeah, it has been a it has been a pretty we're we're gonna need to do a year in review episode episode, but to, to, to the point we started with, enough new stuff is gonna come out between now and the end of the year. It's too soon to do the best of the year, but uh boy, some very strong stuff coming up here at the end. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll we have that in the pipeline. For sure. It's a uh are you are we ready to talk Halloween? I think we are. All right. Uh I don't know if we want to treat this necessarily as a draft because we no. cheated. We we cheated a little this time, yeah. and we 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 checked a little bit in advance because I have a, a couple here that I think are absolutely mandatory. You can't talk about it, but uh, they do come from my wheelhouse, which is a little bit more, uh, which is a little bit more genre specific. Like I like goth shit in general. And I have since I was a kid. I hope I was a weird kid. And to me, like this is the you, you can't talk about the Halloween stuff without talking about goth. But the more time you spend in the topic, I guess there's there's a huge range of things that you could put in here. But boy, I feel like I I, I don't know. Do we want how how many do you want to do? Do you want to do five a piece, ten a piece? What do you think? Well, I, yeah, I think we can go to ten. I I have we're. We're, we're probably both bursting at the seams. Um, so, yeah, let's do 10. All right. And do, do you want to do what kind of order? I mean, to me, there's, this isn't a countdown. Although no, I think it's, the, it's, 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 it's obvious. But. Yeah, it's not a countdown. Um, mine's, you know, like when when we do this, I, I think of it as sort of a playlist. And, and I kind of try to um, have some sort of running order to it. So there's there's a bit of a running order to it, although some of this is going to be improvised because I thought I thought maybe it goes in this order, and then I thought maybe it goes in that order, and and now I think I'm I'm in a different order altogether. So um, I try to do this, you know, like a like a playlist and and uh, have a beginning, middle, and end to it, and we'll see how how well that goes. But that's that's what I'm attempting here. All right. Well, I will, sir. I will give you the honor of going first. Uh, okay. I need to pick first. Okay. So, so I think, uh, I think in the beginning, you just want to set the stage. You want to have the establishing shot. So, just to kind of keep it general um, and and give us a, a base of operation. Uh, I'm just going to go with uh, the Misfits Halloween. Mm-hmm. The Misfits um, are a band, like, there are very few bands that I think you could make a case belong on more than one, uh, or, or, or should be allowed to have more than one song in there. You've you've gone from uh, the early days, if I'm not mistaken here. I mean, yeah. you could pick almost anything off of Walk Among Us, couldn't you? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're kind of, uh, well, there are two here that basically... Um, the the genre is their genre, uh, and and you know the Misfits are one, and I think Rocky Erickson is the other, and you know I only have one Misfits song on here myself. I don't know if you got one, but really, I, yeah. Oh, I okay. Um, I reserve the right. Uh, well, if we're going ten apiece, I will see how the list goes. I'm not sure we're going to have all that much uh, overlap. The only thing I could say about including another Misfits song is, like, some of their non... I love stuff like Hollywood Babylon, and that doesn't... like Just because it's the Misfits doesn't make it for Halloween. So, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Mm-hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go right for the jugular here. I, I think the quintessential song for this playlist and it, it it would fit slot in nicely next to the misfits in my humble opinion is the original goth song the song that made goth a thing Bauhaus Bella Lugosi is dead it, to me without question belongs at the top near the top of any of this list and it happens to be timely in the sense that 2019 is the first year where it's been officially released on uh, in its original recording the full like nine or ten minute version that they they it was like one of the first things they ever did together that original studio version is hands down the best version of it it's finally on spotify and to me that is like absolutely essential it's it's the entire goth genre is it owes its existence to that song so to me that's just it's just basic it's gotta be there absolutely foundational 
Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. I mean, one of us had to pick that. That's absolutely correct. Okay. Um, I'm going to try. You know, like I said, I'm going to try to keep this uh, to be cohesive and and sort of work with yours too. Um, coming off of uh, Bella Lugosi's Dead, I am going to go with uh, Ghost Town by the Specials. Ooh. Which, you know, you, you can look at the lyrics and say, well, no, that's not literally about ghosts. That's about, you know, just a, a, a place where, where nothing is really happening anymore. It's like the nightlife is dead. But if you listen to it musically, they're putting in all of the, uh, the you know, the organ, the old horror, me- horror movie uh, organ and things like that. It's very much what they're going for musically. Wow, I would have never picked that, but you're exactly right. I would recommend the extent. There's, um, if you get the the specials compilations, there's uh, there's a single version which is like three and a half minutes or four minutes, but there's a six minute version that has a little extra spooky in it. Definitely that. Well, that is a that is a quality choice, sir. Uh, I wasn't going that way, but uh, it that's one of the best songs too. Like it's among mm-hmm. their best songs. Yeah, so it's not a novelty record in the slightest. That's no. like a completely legit special song, and uh, thematically, absolutely belongs. Good call. No, thank you. Well, uh, now, uh, it, now I feel stupid because I have to follow something not obvious and good with something obvious that absolutely <laughs> has to be there, and it's Ghetto Boys mind playing tricks on me. You, you absolutely have to have that, if only for the Bushwick Bill uh, verse. But I think the whole thing works. Like, yeah, the Bushwick Bill ver- verse is is makes it a little on the nose, but the rest of the song fits the theme pretty damn well. I gotta say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I I, uh, I applaud having uh, Bushwick Bill <laughs> in here. Um, uh, I, I, he I was about to... this year. He passed away this year, I believe. Oh, I, I didn't. I didn't know that actually. Yeah, um, and and this really well. I think this was like one of the first songs he did with Ghetto Boys too. Like you can't come out too much stronger than the than they did uh, with with him on that record. So kind of uh, uh, going off of the mind playing tricks on me. So last week we talked about Pixies' uh, deep cuts, and. I, you know, burned a pick that I, I would have used here. I probably would have gone with uh, Mr. Greaves, which fits fits this list, I think, to a T. Uh, but I don't want to use the same song two weeks in a row on the list. Uh, but I do want to get a Pixie song in here. I think I think there has to be a Pixie song. And with you go, bridging off of your uh, Ghetto Boys Mind Playing Tricks on Me, I'm going to go with Where Is My Mind and stay with that thematically. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure... For me, there is genuine debate. What is the single best Pixie song? Obviously, Alec Eiffel is going to be at the top of my list. But Where Is My Mind is, is uh, I, I think, the, just that's a consensus best Pixie song, right? Yeah, and and I think musically alone, uh, it would be. Um, and, and I should say, you know, like, I, I think lyrically, I don't think the lyrics have necessarily uh, fit the horror theme the way some of their songs do. But you do have the the Kim Deal kind of you know ghostly uh, vocals on there, and and I think musically it really fits this sort of uh, idea. I'm going to go um, with another one again. These are some obvious ones, and uh, the Cramps are sort of wink wink nudge nudge picks uh, for Halloween. But damn it, I saw them at on Halloween in Los Angeles, like. I, it had to be 20 years ago now. Um, it's some like high school I, they were playing. <laughs> <laughs> it was fucking great. They were fucking great. The, sh- the crowd was fucking great. It was so good to see the cramps at a Halloween show. So, yeah, it's schmaltzy to throw them in there. But I think I- I'm going to give myself dispensation here. Goo Goo Muck belongs on the list because it's one of the great, one of the very few great songs about monsters. Uh, they didn't write it. It's a cover. Um, for some reason, the original's not on Spotify. Um, I'm not sure why, but the uh, the Cramps version is better anyway. Better by a by a mile. 
the the early cramp stuff is so fucking good and goo goo muck is so fucking good and i'm just gonna throw in one more uh personal sidebar on the goo goo muck cramps tip i do not know how this happened but i found a pristine irs records pressing of the goo goo muck seven inch with she said as the flip side at the salvation army in the Czech village, <laughs> in the Czech village in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, when I was like, I don't know, like fourteen or fifteen or something like that, and it was a picture sleeve too. Like it was one of those records where I knew it was cool, I knew it was awesome, but I was scared like my, my other people might see me walking around with a record by the Cramps. So I never have to explain it to my mom or something like that. But I just, I got, I, the cramps belong, at least one cramp song belongs on this playlist, and I think Goo Goo Muck has is, is got to be a consensus pick. I, I think it is. All right, yeah. Um, okay, so, spoiler alert. Yeah. Um, I will have Rocky Erickson on my list. Um, I say spoiler alert now because I'm going to precede that with a, yes. with a, a Rocky Erickson cover. Ooh. Uh, because so since since we're coming off the cramps there, I'm gonna go with the uh, cover first because originally I I was uh, with Rocky Erickson, like the Misfits. Um, there are a lot of songs you can choose from, and I didn't really I wasn't really sure which one I was gonna go with, uh, and I I was thinking maybe it would be I Walked with a Zombie, and then realized I I. I wasn't going to go with uh, that one, um, but since since REM did a cover of "I Walked with a Zombie," I am going to include their version of that song. And Rocky Erickson will be coming up later, but uh, but for now, it's a cover of uh, "I Walked I Walked with a Zombie" uh, with, by REM. Uh, was that on a live record from them? Uh, they might have done it on a live record, but but uh, the version I'm talking about was on a Rocky Erickson tribute album. Yeah, that is a that is a great album, and in fact, I have a pick from it next. Uh, just let's just get the well, let's let's put all the Rocky Erickson stuff together. So, where the pyramid meets the eye, I believe, is the the one you're talking about. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, that is great. I'm gonna pick the. Uh, I'm going to pick the John Wesley Harding if you have ghosts from that, although the the ZZ Top is great on that. Uh, I've always liked it anyway. Um, I don't know how you feel about the Doug song, but I've always thought that was good. Yeah, it it is. But, um, okay, so uh, Doug Psalm, uh, with with the Sir Douglas Quintet, or at least that uh, iteration of Sir Douglas Quintet, Quintet uh, on Austin City Limits once uh, did uh, You're Gonna Miss Me live on Austin City Limits. That's the version. That's that's what you want to go for. Okay. For sure. I mean, I again, I am really bummed that Rocky Erickson pa- passed away this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that his life probably couldn't be described as always very pleasant, and I certainly, you know, the guy's leading a life where he's in pain. I don't want him to have to stay alive just to keep me entertained. Um, but I, I felt like I, I, he's, his loss is pretty huge. Um, he was writing great stuff even when he was having, you know, probably his peak of his mental problems. So his solo stuff is kind of spotty, and and some of the production isn't great. But that stuff is not novelty records, man. The um, the stuff you're talking about, the I Walk With a Zombie, or I like I Love the Original If You Have Ghosts. Mm-hmm. I love John Wesley Harding's version, too. But, like, yeah, he was out of his mind, but the guy wrote incredible, incredible songs. He was gifted in a way that almost nobody ever has been. And he, even some of that later stuff, uh, like Goodbye Sweet Dreams and stuff, I thought was fantastic. So, like I'm cel- I, celebrating him on Halloween is absolutely appropriate, but it's a little bit. I'm a little sad just because he's he's gone. Yeah, um, but yeah, to uh, you, you can't, you shouldn't anyway have a, a Halloween list without Rocky Erickson, um, and and I would say in abundance, we we could easily just be talking about Rocky Erickson for this list. Really, we 
we could be we could start and end it with him. Um, I, I mean, want... the man the man has an album called Gremlins Have Pictures. Like, of course, we should be talking about him. He's fucking yeah. great. Uh, quite a few years back, I saw him not on Halloween, but right around Halloween, and it was uh, it was it was pretty. Uh, it was it was it felt very appropriate. Yeah. So do you have a real Rocky pick? I picked a cover, you picked a cover, but you're going to go with something legit from him. Oh yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, all right, and uh, let me just document that. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go with, uh, so, so I'm just going to mention the ones, you know, that I didn't go with that I thought about. Well, I, I will do, we'll leave that for next year. Let's just, let's just, we won't burn that off. <laughs> but, but, you know, if you have ghosts, that was a strong contender as well. And, and so it's good that we have that represented here. Uh, but I'm going to go with two headed dog, which is, I think one of his very best, and uh, Two Headed Dog was uh, was a, a single that was put out and produced by the aforementioned Doug Som, uh, and that was done when um, when Rocky Erickson was released uh, from the mental hospital, and, and it was something that uh, I, I think it was possibly the first thing he did after that, and and uh, it was you know um, Doug Som was a a friend and a, a fan, I think, and, and, uh, was helping him out. And it, it's, uh, it's about, uh, um, like a mad scientist, although this was a real person, I believe, uh, who was doing experiments in in Russia. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite Rocky Erickson songs. And that's why it's on my list. Yeah. It's the subject matter is probably not, the most pleasant uh sometimes his stuff was not the most pleasant <laughs> no like, the vocal especially not this era yeah. no 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 he wasn't at his peak there uh from a from a mental health point of view the 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 vocal performance on two-headed dog is among the best things he ever did including 13 floor elevator stuff like yeah it's, it's up there it's it's the uh, classic rocky erickson growl um but yeah i mean this was the period where he he did he really delved into that uh, horror music. Yeah, I think it was produ- some of that stuff was produced by one of the by Doug Clifford from Creedence Clearwater Revival. Stu, if I'm not Stu I mean, Sutcliffe, Stu Stu Sutcliffe. God bless St- Stu Cook. I think Stu, Stu Cook. Cook. All right, yeah. I, the fact that I know any Creedence Clearwater Revival band name other than uh, John Fogerty uh, shocks me. Um, that I got it wrong doesn't. Uh, and not Tom Fogarty either. Tom Fogarty. I knew he'd come up eventually. <laughs> um, <laughs> Damn you, Tom Fogarty. <laughs> He's following us. <laughs> All right. I, I think that's a pretty solid. We have REM, uh, John Wesley Harding, and Rocky himself. That's a pretty good. Um, we, someday we should be doing, we should do a show about tribute albums that actually are good. I would say where, where the pyramid meets the eye is one of them. And also there's a great 13th floor elevator, or there was a Rocky Erickson uh, biography uh, that heavy, it's heavily focused on 13th floor elevators. I can't remember the fucking name of it, but I read it. It was fucking great. Um, you really can't go wrong. If Rocky Erickson's one of those, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, you probably read about him all the time. Um, it's, uh, it, it really, that is not bullshit. He you really should spend the time and get to know him with a solo and in the band. Cause uh, it's, it's just great. And it's, even though it's appropriate at Halloween, like, again, I just, I don't know why I keep I obsess over n- not calling this stuff novelty records, but he wasn't like just some nut and, and he didn't make a bunch of novelty records. He was an incredible singer and incredible songwriter. It's, it's really good stuff. Mm-hmm. I can't say the same for my next pick, but I'm putting it on there just because <laughs> it, <laughs> Because it belongs. Uh, I, I'm going to go with the uh, the Falls version of I'm a Mummy. Now, I don't know if you know where that comes from. There was like a child's cartoon where th- it, it, it was like a, it was basically like a goof on beatniks. Um, if you just go onto YouTube and type in I'm a Mummy beatnik cartoon, you probably should be able to find it. So it's this weird 50s cartoon short 
Uh, the Fall did incredible covers, and they did a cover of I'm a Mummy. Uh, it's like two minutes long. Um, it is it is a little bit of a novelty record, but interestingly, at least to me, enough, it got put on like one of their greatest hits records, too. So uh, it's, it's a bit of a goof, but they play the hell out of it. It's actually a great listen. I'm a Mummy by The Fall. All right. Okay, so I think... Uh... Okay, this is this is where mine maybe takes a little bit of a turn. <laughs> I don't know. This is this is the start. Okay, so uh, I mean, this isn't where where it gets dark for me, but but it's it's not dark yet, but it's getting there. Mm, yes. <laughs> so uh, my next pick is uh, "Psycho Killer" by uh, mm. Talking Heads, of course. Which version, the live or studio? Ah, uh, studio. I'm just uh, going studio here. Why is this? Is this crossover? Do we have crossover? no, no? But oh, okay. I mean, uh, I'm a he- talking heads. Uh, I'm a huge fan of theirs, and that stop making sense to me is pro- probably the greatest concert movie ever. It's if it's if it's not the greatest, it's in the top five. And a huge reason why it's great is the way it starts with Psycho Killer. You can't you can't beat that with a stick either. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, so so my next three songs are are <laughs> on the topic of killing. Uh, so so it is well interesting. You know, you know, we're not ready to go there yet because I I I, I think okay, I'm I'm going to backtrack a little bit, but but that's still this is still my pick now, but we're not gonna get too dark yet. Mm, okay, well I I could I can definitely get dark because I was. I'm about to get into, but I have some lightweight shit too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll try to keep it lightweight here for a little while longer. Although stylistically, you can't get much further away from the Talking Heads than my life with the Thrill Kill Cult, one of the great <laughs> bands from the uh, Wax Tracks record label out of Chicago. Their song "A Daisy Chain for Satan" uh, is going to be my next pick. But you got to get the Acid and Flower mix. Uh, it's on their compilation called Industrial Accident. I have been reciting the lyrics of Daisy Chain for Satan to myself for a, for as, pretty much as long as the songs existed. It comes into my head for random reasons. The lyrics are all bizarre or uh, nasty. And of course, uh, if you blurt them out in mixed company, you look like a complete asshole. But it's so catchy. I do it all the time. Thank God one of my, empl- uh, one of my uh, coworkers at work uh, un- is a huge Thrill Kill Cult fan and has uh, 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 understands why every once in a while I have to bust this one out, even when it's not Halloween. Daisy Chain for Satan, Dig It Up by My Life with the Thrill Kill Cult on the Industrial Accident compilation from Wax Tracks Records. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I, I did things in the wrong order. I realize now that uh, I kind of muffed it. Yeah, but neither we haven't really muffed it, Flick, because neither of us have 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 tried to sh- shoehorn a, a Smashing Pumpkins record in here yet. We made it this far. We're 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 this many songs deep, and we didn't go for the the biggest cliche cliche of all time. So so be of light heart. We done okay. good. Well, okay, this is the song I probably should have put before uh, the the last one. I'm gonna go with. Uh... I'm going to go with Dave, uh, David Bowie's uh, Scary Monsters and uh, uh, Spooky uh, <laughs> uh, Super Creeps. I think this is an underrated record. Not that it's not it's not that it's not highly rated. I, mm-hmm. But I, I think it, you know it has to compete with the Berlin records, and then right after it, I think is when Let's Dance came out. Scary Monsters and Super Creeps is a pretty good album. Certainly the first side, like side A. Is is almost perfect. It's unimpeachable in my humble estimation. Yeah, it is strong. I, I don't. I, I, I feel like there's the 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 absolute platinum period of, of Bowie's career, uh, which is you know the early seventies. Um, but um, but yeah, this is good too. All right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna start getting in. I got some. I got some nasty shit now. Some real heavy duty nasty shit coming up. Death Grips Guillotine is my next 
Um, his next for me, I think it was just a single. The video is uh, probably something most people know, uh, if you know anything from Death Grips. I, 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 Flick, are you a Death Grips fan? Have they crossed your, I, your transom at all? <laughs> yeah, not. they haven't crossed the transom, no. Okay, because uh, I only know about him because of Anthony Fantano, uh, or Fantano uh, and the needle drop uh, on YouTube. Like, he is the biggest music nerd on the internet, probably. And of course he likes the fucking Death Grips. Of course he loves... <laughs> this t- like, the Death Grips are, like, the poster child for, like... You, when you don't like weird music, weird music is really off-putting. And in, you know, when you watch normies listen to things like this, they're like, who the fuck buys these records? And it, the answer is me. I buy weird shit like this. I dig weird shit like this. Death Grips guillotine is scary as fuck anyway, like on any given day, but it's perfect at Halloween. I'm putting it on our playlist, and damn it, listen to guillotine by Death Grips. It's way the fuck <laughs> out there. They're way the fuck out there, but damn, it's good. Okay, uh, well, this one, um, this one feels a little bit obligatory, but... I don't feel bad about about it. I, I feel pretty good about it. Uh, we're we're not in in my dark period yet. Uh, in fact, we're probably really lightening up here. Uh, but I'm going to go with uh, Blue Oyster Cults. Don't fear the Reaper. <laughs> <laughs> damn it! Damn it! Damn it! Why didn't I think of that? Blue Oyster <laughs> Cult was that's what they specialized in. Is all this ridiculous yeah, yeah. Boogum boogum. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Damn it! Because I could have picked Godzilla. Godzilla, absolutely. Or this ain't the summer of love would fit in there. There's and I mean burning for you, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it. I mean, but again, that's time to play B sides, and so. You know. Okay, dude. I'm. I. I know we're packed with content, but I. <laughs> when I I was a disc jockey at a classic rock station for a while, and. People used to call asking for like blue oyster cult deep cuts, and when I put, <laughs> you know, like I could not play them. People don't understand. Like most of those stations are scared to play "Don't Fear the Reaper" and "Burn It for You," let alone whatever "Cities on Flame" with rock and roll or "Me 262 or all the fucking deep weird shit of theirs that people used to call for all the time. And I just started telling them, like, dude, do. You- you really think I can play cities on flame with rock and roll, you know, like, like in between American pie and, you know, whatever other fucking shit I had to play. So uh, I don't know. Blue, Blue Oyster Cult is this, this song has become a punchline, but it's not really, it's pretty fucking good. I gotta say. Yeah. Yeah. You can't uh, front on, on the uh, guitar intro and, and, uh, one well, and everybody knows about the cowbell, I guess. So. <laughs> and you know what? They get a bum rap about that too because uh, <laughs> there there are songs with way more offensive cowbell in it than "Don't Fear the Reaper." That's true. <laughs> I mean, it, it is it is one of those things that just happens sometimes where where you become known and and you know at this point, who, who knows what what else they might be known for if if they're even thought of that much. Uh, without that, um, certainly not by a mainstream audience. Yeah, uh, uh, and it, it's just one of those things that you know. Over the course of time, <laughs> you might be totally known f- for something you had no intention of, and that's you where know, they are. Sandy Perlman produced the fucking Clash, so you know Blue Oyster Cult. I, I, they weren't punk per se, but they weren't total like they weren't just garden variety hard rock douchebags. They were in on the joke a little bit, I yeah. think. And yeah. some of their stuff is underrated. The Mirrors album is really underrated. And I listened to it more than you would think. Like I was nine year old nine years old when that album came out. I didn't listen to it at the time. <laughs> I don't know how I found Blue Oyster Cult's Mirrors, but damn it, I did. Um good call. Can't believe I didn't think of it. I, I we this this playlist could be a hundred songs long. All right, so I'm gonna go real dark I actually could get darker than this, but I don't know how to pronounce this band's name. Uh, and and this is one of those records that I only got because I read The Quietus. The Quietus has put more weird, fucking, amazing shit in my ear than anything I could think of. They, they pretty much specialize in just reviewing weird shit. 
And I don't know speed metal from death metal from black metal, but they do, and they generally give great recommendations. And their Baker's Dozen column is one of the greatest ways to find music on planet Earth, is where people who are like weirdos will tell you their 13 favorite albums. They're almost all great. They almost always have incredible shit in them. I don't know how to pronounce this band's name, but it's spelled A-N-A-A-L. N-A-T-H-R-A-K-H. And all Nathrak? I don't know. It doesn't <laughs> matter. The name of the song is called Of Fire and Fucking Pigs. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking love this song. It's I I remember reading about it on The Quietest. They were like, holy shit, this is the best whatever death metal album ever. And I'm like, okay, I'll give this a try. I don't know what this is. And it is like <laughs> it is way the hell out there. I, I don't. I, I can't say that I go listen to it all the time, but I have listened to "Of Fire and Fucking Pigs." Pretty much, I listen to it a lot. It's definitely in my top hundred for the for the two thousand tens as a decade. So I'm gonna put "Of Fire and Fucking Pigs" on here, and damn it, you better fucking listen to it. <laughs> okay um so i i haven't been uh keeping track but i have two more I songs that, go ahead i can do two right? more yeah okay. i can do two more okay so so this is where it gets really dark for me um okay so i, I was going to preface this with with uh talking head psycho killer to kind of give sort of a a segue because i don't feel like it, as much as you know that song is about a psycho killer obviously it isn't. It doesn't seem as dark as as that would normally entail. Uh, but the the next two songs on my list are on the same subject and very much darker than that. Um, so my second, uh, my penultimate uh, pick for this list uh, is uh, Ockerville Rivers for real. Oh, interesting. All right, what album is it from? Uh, that that is uh, from um, Black Sheep Boy, which is among. Uh, I mean, I really their cover of Black Sheep Boy is great. That's a pretty good album, if I recall correctly. Though, that it came out in like two different versions, and one is not as good as the other. Uh, anyway, tell me why you picked this one. Okay, well, yeah, uh, just to just to address that. Well, it it came out as an as an album, and then there was a supplemental EP that was that was the tracks that didn't make it. Uh, then yeah, then it came out as basically a double album, which I, I think it's a great double album. Uh, so that that is the the part that I um, prefer. So anyway, what the, what the song is about is sort of like discovering um, bloodlust and uh, super dark. Um, you know, not really a topic that I normally enjoy exploring, but this is the time of the year where it's appropriate or maybe uh, a bit more appropriate. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, um, it's, I would, I would say this is a, a scary song, not as scary as my last song, but, uh, but this is a scary song. Just All right. kind of exploring that idea of, of, uh, of realizing that uh, you have a thirst for blood, basically. Interesting. Uh, certainly topic appropriate, and I don't know if I can go that dark next, but I, at the same time, I don't want to throw... This is not the time to put Monster Mash on the playlist. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, I don't know if I have anything that comes that heavy. Oh, crap. I don't want to do that. All right, I have to ruin the mood here. Well, we can uh, fix the playlist to make it do whatever the hell we want. Yeah. Um, I can't let this go without including Ministries Every Day is Like Halloween, um, which it, someday we need to talk about the band Ministry because most people think of them as this sort of quasi-metal band. But the truth is, like, their first couple of years, they were this sort of ridiculous synthesizer dance band. And 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 uh, Al Jurgensen saying with this totally ridiculous, like, semester abroad accent like he's british it was <laughs> absolutely fucked up and bizarre um and the last great early ministry record is every day is like halloween i believe that also was on wax tracks records it was not metal it was like very dancey maybe a little on the industrial side but it has a little keyboard 
riff in it like that is just uh, certainly if you grew up in Chicago at the time you heard this song a million fucking times at every party in the world uh it, it's it is a it is a really good record it belongs on this list I wouldn't respect me if I didn't have it on the list so ministries every day is like Halloween okay all right well okay here's where where I just uh just go deep into deep deep into the abyss of of uh darkness here I, it, I don't I don't know of a song that's any darker than this. Um, it's uh, Suicide's uh, Frankie Teardrop. Oh, shit. I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> Fuck. That's a great one. Yeah. Shit. Let's hear it for Frankie. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, what can... Yeah, there's nothing I could say there that you didn't, so I won't. But uh, if this if that if this doesn't terrify you a little bit, then what are you listening for? Like I don't know if you could be reached. Mm-hmm. All yeah. right, that's mm, wow. There's no way I can follow that with the stuff I've got on my bench here. I've got stuff on my bench <laughs> I don't even want to mention. I can get dark. I could get n- into that neighborhood. First of all, I think Towns Van Zant's Marie is at least as dark as Frankie Teardrop. Maybe yeah, that's a topic it, for another time. But yeah, I mean, someone like Towns Van Sant is the only only one that could go into that territory, really. Uh, Shoe shoes. I love abortion. Would be uh, in the neighborhood too. Um, but like all the re- regular goth shit, like the Cure's funeral party and stuff, just doesn't fit here. We've already got the Misfits on. I and we're. I'm. I'm. I'm going to ask you to boycott Smashing Pumpkins because it's just too easy. So I'm really left with only a couple super schmaltzy specials. There's nothing I can do about it. I basically lost this playlist because you got Don't Fear the Reaper <laughs> and Frankie Teardrop. I, um, I like I, how, how everything becomes a competition. Now. Yeah, I don't know, I guess. But I mean, I did get Bella Lugosi's Dead and Mind Playing Tricks on Me and Goo Goo Buck, So, But you win because you got the Rocky Eric's and stuff. And you got Psycho Killer. So, all right, I, I'm going to concede defeat here, and I'm just going to do, I'm going to take the black pill myself and just do Scorched Earth Policy and put one of the drippiest possible songs on there, which is Band of Horses, Is There a Ghost in My House? That is going to be my final song because <laughs> I, I basically have to throw my hands up and admit defeat. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, by the way, I'm being a bit of a liar here. I like that song, and I like Band of Horses. I realize Band yeah. of Horses is like the quintessential like teen drama on the WB network from 15 years ago or whatever. Like yeah, I yeah. realize they're very much like normie wedding song stuff. I have a soft spot for them, and I have a soft spot for that particular song. They did you, name another song Detlef Shrimp, so give them some credit. Yeah, you know what? I no no qualms there. Um, you could say the same thing about Death Cab for Cutie, and I like Death Cab for Cutie. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So Band of Horses is there a ghost? That's my white flag. But you, you, sir, I, or do you have another pick, or or did you close it no, out? No, I, I, you, you can't, you can't come back from Frankie Teardrop with anything. I mean, that's... <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, what a... What am I going to do? I mean, at, at one time I was going to put a classics uh, for Spooky on here. You can't do that after Frankie Teardrop. There's Definitely just no not. I, you know what? No I, to I am I'm going to put the band of horses elsewhere on the playlist. I have some bad news. I don't. Someday we need to get a guest on to tell us why certain songs one day they're available on Spotify and the next day they're not. Your REM cover is not available for streaming right now. So we're one song light. I'm going to replace that with. Uh, Bobby Pickett's uh, Monster Mash, and I'm going to put it. <laughs> I'm going to put it right oh. after Freaky Teardrop. Oh no! Don't do that. <laughs> I I strongly oppose that move. Um, I I would suggest though, uh, just if we can't have REM's version of that, just putting the Rocky Erickson version of that, All so right. we still have the song. All right, you can Monster Mash. <laughs> we are up to the banality draft it was flick's piece pick last week and flick picked bon jovi which uh originally i thought was going to be very difficult because i've never owned a bon jovi record like i diss john mellencamp but i i owned scarecrow at the time 
Uh, I, I knew a little of it. I don't know the Bon Jovi stuff, and I just remember disliking it. But the more time I spent with this, this was like a vacation compared to our recent finality <laughs> drafts. No doubt. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, the, most, most of these I, I'm doing by memory. Um, I didn't go back and do a lot of listening. Uh, that was, I mean, really, we had so much on the plate this week that I, I was busy with, with other things. So most of this is yep. by memory. And, you know, maybe you're pers- persuading me to actually go back and give some of these well, more of a I listen. Get, I do get to pick first this week, and I'm going to pick the most obvious one. But I, I want you to start with it with your headphones on, and I want you to listen to it and soak it in. Like, I never liked that shit, but I've seen the videos like thousands and thousands of times and i'm just trained to have this sort of emotional reaction to it and i gotta say even in the headphones i'm like instantly transported back to ha- having to watch those videos over and over and over again and it wasn't entirely bad <laughs> well that's that's a positive um yeah yeah I'm, again this is to me steely dan is probably the the, the one we've done so far that i actually could would, would get the most enjoyment in listening to our playlist i don't know if this will be number two but it'll be up there it's definitely gonna be up there yeah i mean I, I guess if we're rating them i probably i probably favor the eagles over most of the other stuff that, that we've mm. had to to uh endure for this um most of these have, have been you know like they have one or, or two songs that i like uh I, I think bon jovi is kind of in that category but you're you're maybe right. I mean, a good comp with the ones we've done is Van Hagar. I think they come off looking a lot better than than Van Hagar, but not Van agreed. Halen. No, agreed. Um, yeah, I agree. Well, I, I, it's we we end up we end up getting hung up on like with sticks. It was really just about Tommy Shaw. Like, how are we going to get the Tommy <laughs> Shaw selections in there? There's sort of an elephant in the room in the Bon Jovi. My first pick is from. An, an album that really I think is going to produce disproportionately on this list. I'm going to take "Living on a Prayer" from "Slippery When Wet." The the intro, just that that build, um, and and the sing along chorus. Like, I, I guess you could say I, you could just be cynical and say that they were just writing some like big dumb populist record, but that's really hard to do. And I can't think of a better example of just like sing along, just having a great time at a concert, just having this like happy disposable event. You know, like I don't think they pretend they're they're producing weighty records. I don't think they pretend that they're 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 making important social statements. Like living on a prayer is just a good schmaltzy rec- rock song executed like almost flawlessly, in my opinion. I I. I'm not saying I love it or anything like that, but you you can't argue with the craft on that one. That's my humble estimation. Yeah, I I felt like that was going to be the number one pick. It it was uh, it was not going to be mine though. Um, oh, good. Well, good. Then uh, I I mean I have to know then what's what's because uh, I think it's the gem of slippery when wet. But we shall see. What is your pick, sir? Okay, well, you're saying you didn't pick the gem of Slippery When Wet, then, huh? Well, I think Living on the Prayer is the gem, but you're okay. saying no. What is it? Okay. Uh, well, um, yeah, th- so this is the one song that I would say, like, you, you could take all of the rest of these songs, and, and I don't care, but but there's there's one song that I, that I think um, is the best Bon Jovi song um that is is the one that uh just like on most of these drafts it's the one that i would i would honestly say i would like i would sit down and listen to this and i don't care who did it and or whatever else they did um uh, but uh my my number one pick is runaway fuck <laughs> i wow you know what um i don't i don't laud it as high as you but that's up there. That is yeah. that is definitely high on my list. Well, shit. I thought that was going to be my sneak peek that got me through this list, and you fucking snake it right away. Yeah, no, I, 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 I was thinking, you know, that that might be a pick that you would you you would not rank high, and I was going to see how much I could get away with. 
but I didn't want to risk it because if there's one song that I actually like that I get a draft, I should probably go ahead and draft it. And that's what I did. Wow. Well, your pick is that is um, it is unimpeachable. That is actually a great song, although I I don't know if that record or, or Aldo Nova's Fantasy came first, but they're the same record. <laughs> like They're they're the same record. Uh, they even they're produced to sound exactly. There was a lot of that sort of um, right hand eighth notey <laughs> hard rock stuff. There has to be fifty records that sound like that, but they were great at it. Good pick. Fuck you. Um, <laughs> I forgot to mention I'm recording from New Jersey. Um, I, I've lived in New Jersey before. I just moved here over the summer. Uh, I've lived here a few times, and nobody. I have never heard anybody in new jersey talk about loving bon jovi i think they're from the <laughs> Phil- i think they're from the philadelphia side of new jersey to be honest with you which might as well be on the other side of the equator uh philly jersey and new york jersey to be are are there they don't they don't really they're not the same thing at all everybody eats taylor ham and that's about it so i don't like living on a prayer has that great jersey narrative it's very believable um, it's absolutely in character. You've taken Runaway away from me, so I'm going to grab what I think, again, Slippery When, Slippery when Wet to me is the, uh, it's not even close in terms of album quality. Uh, I'm going to leave You Give Love a Bad Name to you, and I'm going to take Wanted Dead or Alive. Um, not because I love it or really go around listening to it, but if you're going to write like a modern cowboy song without being hmm. Brett Michaels or some hacky douchebag from CMT, you can't do much better than that. Uh, the We've seen a million faces and we rocked them all is a great line. It's super populist. It's a super, it seems super easy and over simple, but it's too good to just be explained away like that. It's a legit heavy duty, well-written song Beautifully executed, absolutely um, a great. There are not many ballads from that era that I like. There's very, very few that I can think of that I genuinely would say, like, oh, that's quality shit that people will care about in 20 years. But I think Wanted Dead or Alive will have a, a legs and history for them for a long, long time. Wow. Um, yeah, I will say that. Uh... That I figured you would you would go with living on a prayer one, and if I was going to be strategic, I would get dead or alive with my number one pick. I didn't want to risk runaway. Wow, you so, you are really firing all cylinders because uh, that that's not bad. I mean, I originally I only grabbed one of dead or alive up here because once with runaway off the board and living on a prayer off the board, it really drops precipitously for me from here. Like yeah, that, that's it. Those the our first three are about as much as I can tolerate. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so you're taking the big guns off the table, and yeah, I am kind of obligated to just go with. You give love a bad name. I don't really. Uh, yeah, I gotta gotta do that. Gotta yeah. Go all right. Do that. This is this is this is gonna so. Wow, this is going to be a disaster because I did not prepare enough songs, I think, for the duplication here. So I have to go very strategically here. Uh, you've taken You Give Love a Bad Name. That pretty much only leaves me with, uh, I have to take the only killer song on uh, the New Jersey album, which is uh, Bad Medicine. And I don't mean killer in the sense that I like it. I mean <laughs> that it's... Like it doesn't induce vomiting, so uh, I'm taking bad medicine from the New Jersey album. After that, and we're up yeah, to and on, five. on on my list. That is simply BM. <laughs> I think you speak for us all, but I had to. <laughs> I had to pick something. <laughs> I had to do something. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> we're gonna end up with ballads <laughs> i think that uh, was well, really we'll oh no <laughs> keep going yeah oh fuck uh, uh, oh. I, i'm not sure <laughs> okay so so uh uh you know um <laughs> come on 
So I, my, my next pick, uh, of course, you know, having an album called New Jersey, you're going to probably have a, a Springsteen approximation on it. And it does. And so, so I'm going to, and, and I'm, I may be a sucker for that. If you do it in a halfway decent way, it, it proved to be the case with John Mellencamp uh, or John Cougar as he was when he was, uh, when he was trying to approximate Springsteen more. Uh, but anyway, uh, blood on blood is, is my, my pick. All right. It's a defendable pick, but I, I can't, you know, I'm going to listen to this playlist because we made it. It's the product of our work, our blood, our sweat, and our tears. But I, there, that song would have never entered my mind again in my life if you had not just mentioned it. I respect <laughs> your, I respect your, your moxie and your strategy. But the, I mean, the content of your pick there is empty calories from a soul point of view. Well, sure. Um, most, of, most of this is, of course. Yeah, but some is worse than others. You know, like empty <laughs> calories are everywhere, but some you got to chew on really hard and they hurt your teeth. This is that's one of them. All right. Um, I believe we discussed the rules of this playlist allows me to make this move. Uh, I know where you're going. And mm-hmm. I don't think I have much of an option. Now, this song does appear on Bon Jovi's greatest hits compilation that came out in 2010, even though it is technically a John Bon Jovi solo record. Uh, Blaze of Glory from the Young Guns 2 soundtrack is my next pick, which is, I mean, it's a really shameful ripoff, in my opinion, of, it's it's like, who was it that was, uh, didn't Neil Young get sued for plagiarizing himself? <laughs> yeah, uh, um, no, wait, uh, no, John Fogarty did. John Fogarty did, okay, that's totally unfair. But in this case, I think it would have been a fair lawsuit to sue John Bon Jovi <laughs> for ripping off John Bon Jovi uh, with Blaze of Glory. But the, I, I literally, I am almost out of ideas. The fact that we kind of got to Blaze of Glory this soon means we're in for pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, um, that, that did kind of have to get done. And you corner the market on on Bon Jovi cowboy songs. So congratulations. <laughs> I won't say that wasn't my strategy. I just won't. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I will never have even. I would have never listened to that song again. You picked Bon Jovi, you son of a bitch. Now I've had to listen to that song like <laughs> ten times. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. I... I will say for value, you probably got that you you've had the better draft here. You, I may have won the Halloween list. You won this, uh, <laughs> but I got Runaway, and I guess that's what really matters to me. That's true. Um, at this point, I'm picking up scraps, and uh, I I think uh, I think I got I have no choice but to go with like uh, lay your hands here. Mm. Yeah, I respect the choice. Don't respect the song. I don't know where you could have gone. I mean, uh, I'm going to drop that in here. So we're kind of down to the ballads. If you want charting records, if you want records that are have that sing-along value, we're kind of down to the ballads only. Um I'm afraid I'm going to have to... I'll go with the... I would have not guessed that three songs from the New Jersey album would end up on this playlist. (laughs) But here we are. I'm going to take I'll Be There For You. Uh, Not because I enjoy it. I think I used to work overnight at the Kmart uh, on the north side of Cedar Rapids when that record was out. And we'd have the radio play at night and they'd put the the microphone, you know, like, attention Kmart shoppers. They would just put a boombox next to that mic I think they played that song like once an hour during that period. <laughs> I think I've heard I'll be there for you. Cause I worked overnight. I was doing the stock. I think I've heard I'll be there for you. Like at least two, three times a night for months and months on end. I, I just have muscle memory for it. I remember it. It's terrible, but there you have it. Yeah. Well, and, and this isn't intentional or any sort of theme I'm working on here, but my last two songs will both have hands in the title. Mm. And so my last pick is going to be Raise Your Hands. Wow. Um, That means Always didn't get on this list. Mm. Yeah, well, 
Too in shy. and out of love. Nothing from 7,800 Fahrenheit, which I don't know what that's a reference to. Nothing from that album <laughs> later on either. Like, I don't... Why, why would you have an album? Is that... What burns at 7,800 Fahrenheit? Artistic integrity? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I should Google it. I don't know. 7,800? 7, <laughs> More cowbell. Uh, <laughs> so they put out... A, the album with Runaway came out in like 1983 or 84, if I'm not mistaken. And um, Slippery When Wet came out in like 86 or 87. Let's see here. 86? In between <laughs> was the album 7,800 Fahrenheit in 1985. Wasn't a big career advancer for them, I don't think. Um, so 7800 7, Fahrenheit is also the name of a of a Bon Jovi tribute band, in case you're <laughs> I'm, to... <laughs> Well, I live in New Jersey. I have to think I could probably I could pro it's a buyer's market for Bon Jovi tribute bands. I'm in the one state in the union where I think I on any given night probably could find one. <laughs> But but over in Camden, not not so much. That's in true. I, again, I people. Everybody in New Jersey claims Bruce. I just I can't remember anybody claiming. I've never heard anybody be like, "Yeah, welcome New Jersey. Here's your copy of, uh, of the album New Jersey by Bon Jovi." I just I can't remember anybody caring about it that much. All right. Yeah, I, I I guess I guess uh, not only Bon Jovi but Misfits tonight. It, it's a uh, it's a Jersey night. That's true. That is very true. Um, you know what? Uh, I was. Uh, I really do think "Living on a Prayer," "Run Away," and "Wanted Dead or Alive." I really do think those are pretty good songs. They're actually. I wouldn't buy them. I wouldn't go out of my way to listen to them. But if they're on, they're not bad. Yeah, I will say. I you know like really I. It doesn't matter if I ever hear "Dead or Alive" again in my life. I will say though that uh, I wish you would have picked "You Give Love a Bad Name" and I could have got "Dead or Alive." That would have uh, worked. Out I great definitely good. I definitely tried to fuck you out of uh, getting that because yeah. you got run away. So that worked. All right. Well, you won the most important thing this week, which was the Halloween playlist. Um, <laughs> I get to pick next week's banality draft, and I've I've been telegraphing for weeks. We just need to bite the bullet and be done with the, uh, the Doobie Brothers. Okay. Ah. Uh... And Michael McDonald really is the Tommy Shaw of that draft. Like, how do you navigate around the Michael McDonald portion of the, the Doobie Brothers catalog? This There's a lot of intrigue there. This is going to be Machiavellian in scope. I would say it's more like uh, he's the Dennis D. Young of the list because I didn't really try to avoid Tommy Shaw. I tried to avoid Dennis D. Young. Um. On our playlist of stick songs, I was able to uh, I was able to find a video. I, I linked to it in our on the playlist of Dennis D. Young explaining uh, where the great piano part for "Come Sail Away" comes from. You'll never guess until you watch. <laughs> I strongly advise you do. It will answer lots of questions and concerns people have about Dennis D. Young and the band Sticks. Uh, but for now, it is Doobie Brothers time. Uh, on our next exciting edition of the uh, Left of the Dial podcast. <laughs> French. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs>